you know what fascinates me um, so much on this topic of the Civil War is I was talking to this guy, uh, Kevin Wood, who is a, I'm going to get this wrong. He's a, because at first I said he's a Lincoln impersonator and then he corrected me. He said, no, I'm a Lincoln portrayer. And from what I've heard before, Lincoln was not super religious or like he didn't belong to a affiliation. But Kevin was telling me, though, that in lots of Lincoln speeches, he quotes, you know, scripture or he references God and such. So he was kind of letting me know. And he actually wants to write a book on it someday on uh, Lincoln and his references to religion. Um, That's what fascinates me about Abraham Lincoln and this time period, how we have one of our greatest presidents, um, arguably, and not and not to have been like officially affiliated with a certain religion. I don't. Can can you speak to that really quick? Like, well, yeah, Lincoln. Lincoln uh, obviously grew up in the backwoods, and the reality was uh, in early America, and, and a lot of people kind of think that. The way people are religiously today, or the way society is religiously, is uh, the way it always was. And for instance, I was born in, in 1953, and and you know we were at a point post-war that everybody belonged to a church, but it was easy to belong to a church. Everybody was join, you know, becoming joiners. You know, they they all belonged to the PTA if they had children. You know, they all had you know, all the men had a bowling league. You know, that they belonged to whatever. And yeah, there was high church membership. If you're in the backwoods, you know, Lincoln was born um, just after the turn of the 19th century, 1809. And and, and uh, if you're in the backwoods, uh, becoming a member of church, depending on where you are, maybe maybe very very difficult. That's not to say his family didn't have some uh, religious beliefs or you know spirituality. But uh, it doesn't seem to have connected early on as much with Lincoln. In fact, I think it was in the 1840s, Lincoln wrote uh, a, uh, an essay that hasn't been very widely circulated, uh, basically agreeing with and promoting the idea of atheism. Um, but Lincoln, and we can talk about this with other things, but one of the things that attracts me to Lincoln is Lincoln is not a man set in his ways. Lincoln changes his mind on lots of things, including race, slavery, but race particularly over time. Um, in terms of religion, when the Civil War comes, it's a spiritual crisis for whole lots of people, North and South. And that's when Lincoln begins infusing lots of biblical uh, flourish, biblical references into his speeches, into uh, the things he writes. And I think it is more and more uh, a reality for Lincoln. Lincoln is seeking both a higher power to help him in this great crisis. He's also seeking to give deeper meaning to the crisis, to the conflict, and and uh, finding that in spirituality uh, is uh, is a path that he takes and. He does begin to show up in churches on occasion and so forth. Um, it doesn't mean that Lincoln, you know, isn't every Sunday person a member, or whatever. But he he does take religion and particularly Christian faith more seriously. Whereas he was real comfortable, you know, a couple decades early with the idea of atheism. Wow. And really quick before we get the ball rolling, because I I already I love. I love uh, this foot that we, or this path that we're now uh, taking. Um, my name is Chris. This is Cheetash. And today with me, a very special guest. And Roy, I'm sorry if I get your last name wrong. Is it Finkenbein? Finkenbein. You absolutely have it. Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, do you prefer uh, Roy or Dr. Finkenbein? Tell me Roy. That's fine. Okay. Um, Roy, I had reached out to Roy uh, several months back. Um upon my fascination with 
Civil War history, and I, lo and behold, um, found you just through the great old internet. Um, Roy, I'm just going to give a little bit. You're professor of history, uh, department co-chair at the University of Detroit Mercy, but um, please introduce yourself because I know you're, you have a lot of other accolades in addition to those. Well, I, I, I uh, you know, uh, am wearing lots of hats this term. This is what happens when you're an academic and somebody leaves. So short term, I'm interim director of African American Studies, and I'm chairing a search committee to find my replacement, which is <laughs> one of the things you have to do. Uh, I suppose outside of the university, uh, I just finished a, a six years as a member of the board of editors of the Michigan Historic Review, Historical Review. And I am a member of something called the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission, which is a state commission which deals with kind of our protecting, preserving, promoting our underground railroad history in Michigan, of which we had considerable. Um, and uh, so those are some things about me. Um, other than the fact, you, you know, I'm, uh, I'm 69 and as my students uh, uh, sometimes do when I, when I teach the Civil War class at, at uh, Detroit Mercy, you know, when I talk about something in the 20th century and indicate it was something that I experienced, I witnessed on TV or whatever, I hear these audible gasps. So in the words of Ronald Reagan, I appreciate history because I've lived so much of it. <laughs> uh, your classes and the classes you teach these days, would you say is it mostly made up of this uh like generation Z age group? Yeah, I have uh I had you know, we're a university that has a number of non-traditional students, but I'd say in my classes, they're generally in that eighteen to twenty-three uh age group. Um I, you know, each each uh semester I'm reminded that uh my cultural references have grown more and more stale. I can't make reference to something that I think is fairly current, like from the 90s to the early 2000s, and it's something they're completely unaware of. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I get educated every day. And, uh, and how long have you been teaching? Uh, I've been in the profession since uh, 1981, so 42 years almost. I've been teaching, for, I, early on, I was with a research project since 1991, uh, so 32 years I've been teaching full-time. Wow. Long, long time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've seen a lot of students, and, uh, you know, it's always interesting when they, they pop back on campus and say, do you remember me? And it's like, I remember the face. Now tell me your name and what class I had you in. <laughs> In in that time period, I'm curious because I, I love talking about generations. And have you noticed shifts in generations from like earlier, your early career versus like like nowadays with uh, the, the student population that you teach? Well, we go, you know, we go through ebbs and flows and I've had a chance to go through several of those. I suppose the the last decade and a half, you know, the post financial crisis, uh, period, uh, more and more students enter college as undergraduates, very vocationally focused, you know, when I was in school, um, and then again, I think we saw some of this in the nineties, uh, a lot of students that, you know, they may, wanted to make a difference in the world. And so they might, you know, they, they might convince their parents that they were going to be a philosophy major or they were going to be a, you know, sociology major. And their parents are like, what, <laughs> you know, what are you, what are you doing? We, we want, we, we want you to go into engineering or nursing or architecture, you know, pre-med, something that, uh, that may lead to a, a much more remunerative career. Um, the last 15 years, much more vocational, but it started to turn with COVID. And, um, you know, I, without mentioning names, had several students that contacted me during the whole COVID crisis that I had had earlier in class and said, you know, um, I'm rethinking this engineering major or I'm rethinking, uh, you know, this architecture major. Um, not only does history fascinate me, but I think there's a chance that I, I could make 
that maybe I could do something that would be more impactful and something that I have more of a passion for. And so th there's always these turns and I think we're on the cusp of it. In fact, uh, we have something called Accepted Students Day and we had that a couple of weeks ago on the weekend. And uh, the College of Liberal Arts had the second largest um, group of students there for Accepted Students Day. These are people that have been admitted to the university, probably gonna come and just there to kind of check it out, meet, meet people in the department where they're gonna major and that kind of thing. And the fact that it was the second largest group that hasn't happened for liberal arts in some time. So I think we're, you know, we're, we're in the flow in terms of liberal arts, the flow of this ebb and flow, ebb and flow. That's really cool. Yeah, that's, that's really cool to hear. It, now, your interest in the, these topics over this over overarching umbrella of uh, the Civil War time period. How how did that start? Did that start at a very young age? Well, I've always I've always found history interesting, and my mother uh, started her adult life as a school teacher, and so she fed some of that. Even though you know she became a farm wife and didn't continue on with full time teaching for a number of years. But um, she fed that and would get me history books. And, you know, we lived uh, just on the edge of town on a farm. And it was a short walk down to our, you know, village library, public library. And, uh, you know, as people used to do at that point, um, you know, pre-social media, pre-internet. And I, I started life pre-television. We didn't have one in our house till. I was probably third grade and, you know, we'd do the summer reading programs, you know, and go down there. And I was always gravitating towards the history section and getting history books, biographies, and looking backwards, probably the, the ones that I, you know, um, was most fascinated by and took home to read were civil war era, you know, Lincoln, Grant, Lee, uh, and and that same period in terms of the development of the frontier, you know, Colt, Bridger, those kind of people. Um, and so as I, you know, as I went on and, and got into graduate school, I, I tended to gravitate towards uh, that period in terms of the period I emphasized and more and more throughout my life gravitated more towards the questions around slavery and abolitionism and, um, you know, African-American resistance of that period and so forth. And do you know in your family tree, do you have a family who fought in the Civil War? No, it's kind of ironic. To the best of my knowledge, uh, I don't. And in fact, um, uh, partially by happenstance, there's a long tradition in our family of avoiding military service. Some people might not. It, you know, part of I I won the Vietnam draft lottery, for example. You know, uh, that was 1972, I think. And you know how it was. I don't know if you know how it was organized, but you know, literally the Secretary of Defense came on network TV. He had the big clear ball with all the little balls with 366 dates on them, and then picked them out. And if you were picked one, you were going to be, you know, high on the draft list. And I was 364. So it's like nuclear war, and I'm probably not going to go. Wow. My brother uh, got out through an educational deferment. My dad in World War II, you know, he he uh, he kept, and I, you know, when we cleaned out the house after his death, I inherited uh, an envelope full of his changing draft status during World War II. You know, he'd be one A at one at one point, and then he'd go down to an F, and one A was, you know, likely to be drafted and F was likely to be deferred. And ultimately in the swing of things, he ended up getting an agricultural deferment because by later in the war, they desperately needed uh, um, all sorts of things, including farm products. And so a, a number of farmers uh, got deferred and he did. I, beyond that, going back, uh, I know my grandfather who also had my name of Roy, uh, didn't serve. And that was probably more a timing thing when World War I came up. He was 
you know, older when World War I came along. Civil War, I don't really know. I haven't done enough uh, genealogical work. I know a lot of those German immigrants didn't uh, didn't choose to serve. Um, there was more. Um, uh, they certain they certainly they certainly uh, many of them were anti-slavery to a larger or smaller degree, but uh, they weren't out there volunteering for military service. Uh, unlike the Irish who were trying to prove their Americanness or some other groups that were trying to prove their Americanness. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's all I can tell you about that story. Okay. Nice. You know, what fascinates me is they're still, I was just listening to, I forget this author's name. He he teaches at, he's a professor at the University of Texas. He was on the Lex Friedman podcast and he just had a book come out on uh, the Civil War. And it, it still surprises me, but maybe it shouldn't, that there's still books being written about surrounding this topic. And is there still, are there still th like new things that we're learning about this time period? Uh Yes. You know, history keeps getting expanded and revised because people find new things. Sometimes they go looking for them. Sometimes, as has happened to me throughout my career, sometimes you stumble across things. And uh, also, at different points in our history, things that are happening in society cause us to refocus and look at things anew. For example, you know, a good part of the writing of Civil War history early on in the Civil War, to probably the 1960s, tended to be um, what we sometimes jokingly call ballots and bullets history. Um, in other words, political and, and military history. And uh, the 60s opened up a whole lot of things. Uh, you know, what were women's roles during the Civil War, and not only finding that a significant number of women enlisted pretending to be men, but you know what's happening on the home front. Um, a lot of women have to keep the home front going, whether it's being on, you know whether it's on plantations in the South, uh, whether it's uh, um, farms or you know cities in the North. They have to keep things going. You know, what were blacks doing? I mean, there's, uh, you know, when glory was made now an amazing third of a century ago, when glory was released, even Denzel Washington, who played a major role, said, I didn't know blacks fought in the Civil War. Well, all of a sudden, with that movie, a lot of people refocused um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, it's out of that movie, for, for instance, the African-American reenactors movement really got its footing. But a lot of historians refocused. A, a friend of mine who uh, um, uh, found this out, uh, who's a historian, said all of a sudden the records, which exist in an archive on the Massachusetts 54th, which was the, the unit kind of loosely portrayed in glory, all of a sudden it went from maybe one person a year would go and look at those records to dozens coming in each day and wanting to use those records so it became it became a logistical problem and you know the uh 180,000 um uh roughly 180,000 black men served in the union army once lincoln you know the emancipation proclamation had two main components the liberation of blacks in the confederacy you know those areas still um rebel occupied, but also it allowed for the enlistment of black troops. And in the last half of the war, 180,000 black troops uh, served. Um, that's about a tenth of the total Union force, but it came at a time when Lincoln was desperate for manpower. One, they were losing more than they won up to that point. Secondly, there were people whose enlistments were running out who weren't re-enlisting you know, among white troops. And um, uh, so this African-American manpower became crucial. 
And think about it's 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 a tenth of the total, but it's only in the second half of the war. So you almost have to double the impact that black troops had. And, uh, you know, they they uh, played a major role in 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 some of the battles in the second half of the war. And they were the first ones into Charleston and and uh, into uh, Richmond and and so forth. Uh, they played a major role at the siege of Petersburg, for example. I mean, just a uh, phenomenal, uh, phenomenal record of service and probably another 20,000 served in the Union Navy once they could do that. So black role in the Civil War, that's something that, you know, when I was growing up, nobody really talked about, very few people knew about, um, with the exception of maybe a few uh, black historians at HBCUs who didn't get widely read or published. Um, so, you know, to give you a figure that's just amazing to me, uh, of how much blacks invested in the war. Free blacks in places like Detroit and across the North, you know, those who were not legally owned, but lived in communities like Chicago and Detroit and New York City and Boston and so forth. 70%, 74% of the men of military age in those African-American communities enlisted. You could look at every other category uh, in that war, you know, the white men in the South, white planters, you know, sons in the South, you know, uh, Midwestern farm boys, you know, whatever you want, and nobody approaches anywhere close to that figure. Once Lincoln made this a war for emancipation with the Emancipation Proclamation, blacks rushed to fight because it was their war. Um, there's a, uh, if I could ramble on a second, there's a guy named Absolutely. Menominee Mamie, Connecticut, mixed African, Native American, African American, Native American. And um, his wife writes him a letter. You know, she's on the home front. Her husband is gone. She's without the main breadwinner. She's worried about him. And she writes a letter pleading for him to come home. And he writes back to her and says, you know, honey, I miss you. I'd love to be there with you, but let me tell you what this war is about. This is a war about our future as a people. This is a war for freedom. This is a war about our children's you know, future. Um, and by the end, you know, if you read it, you're kind of sobbing too, because he so powerfully portrays what black men were thinking and why they went to the fight with such uh, passion and diligence. Um, that really has been overlooked. Um, I think some of the technology of the war until the last few decades was overlooked. I mean, it was a, it was a war where a lot of technological change, you know, we went from, we went from muskets to rifles. And, and then the military, uh, kind of the military strategies had to catch up with that. You know, early in the war, you, you march across the field towards an, you know, a line firing on the other side. And it's like, not a huge deal. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it. It's not a huge deal compared to what happens when everybody has rifles and they could just mow people down and then more accurate and more powerful artillery. Uh, that's why, you know, think of uh, um, the advance at uh, Gettysburg uh, where people just got mowed down at one point, um, the, the uh, over, I think it's about a hundred yard field and, you know, the the uh, uh, the uh, Union just mowing down the Confederates as they advance. That wasn't something that was possible to be in the war. Now we're spending more time looking at those advances, you know, balloons uh, as reconnaissance, uh, just, you know, Gatling guns, a whole range of, of things. The important role of railroads, which, you know, railroads weren't around at the War of 1812, 
and they weren't part of the Mexican War because the geography of where railroads were and where the war took place. Um, but by the Civil War, uh, they became important for so many reasons, not the least of which you could move man and material very, very quickly in ways that it would have taken a lot, much longer time before that. And so, you know, the, the, the war, uh, in terms of technology and technological change, uh, people are paying more attention to. Um, I just think there's a, there's a lot of things that, uh, that, uh, um, we can continue to write about. Um, I, uh, uh, I expect that, uh, there's going to be more and more on starting to emerge on the home front. Uh, you know, both North and South, I see more and more writing about what's going on on the home front. Um, not just politically, it used to be the case, but, you know, um, how it's affecting people's lives. You know, there's, um, I even had, uh, when I taught at Hampton some years back, had a, uh, uh, a master's student in music. I ended up on his committee because he was tracing how the music changed during the war, you know, on both sides, North and South, at the beginning of the war, uh, the music is, you know, this lilting, uplifting, you know, uh, we're gone off the war kind of stuff. And by the middle of the war, you, know, you get when John, you know, these, these slow, mournful pieces, like when Johnny comes marching home and so forth, the vacant chair, uh, et cetera. So there's, yeah, there's always stuff to write about. Part of its perspective changes. Part of it's we find new stuff. You know, there's still, that amazes me, and some of this is Civil War related, there are still collections that turn up in people's attics when the children and grandchildren come in to uh, to clear out the house and they find, you know, a cache of letters from a Civil War ancestor that had been passed down, but, you know, now a couple generations on, people would know about these and they open up a trunk or they open up a box and, wow, you know, our ancestors win the war and we got a record of, you know, great, 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 great grandpa riding home every week to his wife and children. So yeah, yeah there's a lot, there's a lot more. I think it'll, it'll continue just as Lincoln. There's always new things to say about Lincoln. Oh yeah. That's funny. That kind of reminds me of <laughs> if you've watched this uh, show, I don't think it's on anymore, but like storage wars where they just uh, bid on these lockers and <laughs> right, right, right. lo and behold, you bid on a locker, not expecting much. And yeah, you find some memorabilia or some letters from the Civil War time period. Um, yeah. Wow. That's that's very cool. Something going back to something that you mentioned earlier with the enlistment of African-Americans uh on, on the union side, did they face, like, even though it, even though it was the union side, did they face any sort of, was it tough for them to coalesce or like assimilate into the army? Did they face any sort of backlash from the union soldiers? Well, I think they faced backlash in, 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 in a multiplicity of ways. Um, first of all, they were, unless they were light enough to pass, which happened on occasion, we have records of people who prior to blacks being able to enlist, you know, uh, one guy I'm particularly thinking of, he enlisted with a Connecticut unit just by pretending to be white. Um, uh, even though he's from an African-American family and, and probably the, you know, the census identified him as, 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 uh, mulatto is probably what they would have put at that point. Um, um, but you had all black units, you know, once Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation allowed blacks to enlist, uh, you had all black units, um, initially formed at the state level, like the, uh, you know, the fifth Ohio artillery, the Massachusetts 54th and 55th infantry regiments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then in 1864, these were kind of all merged into an overarching umbrella called the U.S. Colored Troops. Now, um, blacks in the U.S. Colored Troops were not only in all, all black units, but 
those were almost always led by uh, white officers. And you had white officers that were much more sympathetic and empathetic, like Robert Gould Shaw with the Massachusetts 54th. And you had others who really demeaned and mistreated the men under them and thought little of them. Um, in terms of the military high command, there were real doubts about the, you know, because blacks had been so stereotyped and most of them were slaves. And the argument for keeping them as slaves is they were stupid and they couldn't work without white direction and, and all of this. Um, and they were naturally docile. Um, tell Matt Turner that, but, <laughs> uh, uh, the military high command, you know, from the secretary of war Stanton and Grant on down didn't really believe that blacks could become good soldiers. That kind of speaks to the desperation of our manpower at that point, that they would go along with Lincoln's idea of enlisting them. And ironically, it was Fort Wagner, you know, the assault you see in glory where the masses, the Massachusetts 54th under Robert Gould Shaw, you know, makes this headlong rush uh, up the beach at Battery Wagner, briefly gain control of it, and then are beaten back and die in huge numbers and are buried in a big sand pit with Shaw himself. That act of courage dissuaded a lot of, and it was reported widely in the press. You know, there were Civil War reporters all over the place, North and South, um, and it got carried through the Atlantic Cable to England and you know, they knew about this in Europe and so forth. That act of courage really convinced a lot of the military high command, as did some later uh, battles that blacks fought in, that uh, that blacks had the courage to be good soldiers. That answered some of the questions. Um, so they're kind of demeaned sometimes within their units. They're kind of demeaned by other soldiers who are whites. Uh, the demeaned by the military high command at points. Oftentimes they're given lesser rations, medical care, more inferior guns, et cetera. Um, and early on assigned to supply duty at a higher rate than whites or, you know, or, or simply guarding territory as opposed to being involved in actual battles. As time goes on, more and more and more because they prove themselves. Now, the public is very split. Um, there are, are many whites in the northern public that uh, become f convinced very quickly of Blacks' ability because of the courage they're showing on the battlefield and the need for them. Um, and you actually see an improvement in the attitudes of many whites, racially speaking at least for a time, it kind of goes away after the war a little bit. But you also see people who get very upset when Lincoln pairs the Emancipation Proclamation with the enlistment and very quickly, literally, you know, that's in January and in March, a draft law goes into effect. Um, and uh, uh, particularly the Irish, but Germans in the Midwest you know, I, I've read about this in the Dayton paper at the time, Dayton, Ohio paper, et cetera, uh, and others riot, obstruct, you know, the New York draft riots are just brutal. Five days of just brutalization of black folks. And the only way they ended is by bringing the troops right after Gettysburg up to New York City, some of them to quell the riots. But the attitude was, we're not going to fight in a war that now, is about ending slavery. We don't want to be forced via draft to fight for black folks, essentially is what they're saying. And that was a, that was a mix of things. I mean, the fear that uh, as kind of the bottom of the economic ladder, Irish were that along with blacks, that more blacks would come up and compete for their jobs. And, you know, plus they, gotten off the boat a couple decades earlier and they'd imbibed a lot of the stereotypes in the broader popular culture and uh, just a whole host of things. But yeah, you know, there was a lot of upset. New York, greater New York, Boston, lower Midwest. Detroit had a 
a race riot that included this in 63. So just a whole lot of uh, blowback. Um, but I think by the end of the war, overall, white American Northerners attitudes towards blacks, if we did Gallup polling at the time, had improved. But it took that courage on the battlefield. It took the circumstances of war. And, uh, you know, black folks had to put up with a lot in the army, including originally being paid at a lower rate for the same rank, which is why many of them, including the 54th, chose to uh, not accept their pay until it was equal. Now, how does that imp impact the family at home? Right. Um, and in a few cases, those folks were shot as mutineers simply for saying we won't accept pay until it's equal. So there's a, yeah, there's a whole lot that blacks are fighting against and not just the Confederates. Wow. I, I wanted to uh, pivot slightly. I wanted to ask you about uh, the Underground Railroad and Th this might be kind of a silly question, but was it was it underground, and what did it have anything to do with like an actual railroad that like we think of? Um, it it was almost never underground. Yeah, I mean there were caves sometimes involved and things like this as hiding places, but it was not underground. Underground railroad is a metaphor that comes along by the 1840s to describe this kind of haphazard network, you know, the network of uh, freedom seekers and those that were willing to assist them. Um, the, uh, uh, the railroad itself, like I said, it's a metaphor, the underground referring to the fact that it's hidden the railroad, because it's the new technology on the block. You know, today, if we had something like that, somehow I'm sure internet or, you know, something would get into that metaphor. But uh, it was a means of, you know, it was a network of transportation. And so they drew in the railroad idea. It was hidden since the underground. Um, you know, before that, they'd used a mix of things. One of the most popular was the referred to chains of friends. And what they're talking about is the network of people that might know somebody further down the road that could also help a freedom seeker. The reality is most freedom seekers don't get assistance except maybe from other slaves or a few free blacks till they get above the Mason Dixon line or the Ohio River. Uh, and their communities of, you know, and talking about things changing, like you mentioned with the Civil War, you know, um, Wilbur Siebert, who was an Ohio State University professor, uh, did this massive study published in 1898. People still refer to it. I mean, it's uh, had all sorts of good information, but it was very white in its orientation. And so the involvement of non-whites, you know, the black freedom seekers were kind of anonymously presented. And uh, because he wrote letters to community after community, Whites kind of told their story in letters back to him. So that's what gets presented in the book. Um, and uh, you have what I'm finding, because I'm one of the few people that's really looked in the Midwest at that early period, 1790 to say 1830. Uh, early on, I mean, you'll have the odd person here and there who takes people in, but in terms of a network, you really don't. Um, and so a lot of freedom seekers, and that's what the 1790s is really when you start to see people go north as far as Michigan looking to get to Canada, first Amherstburg and then Detroit over to Sandwich, which today is part of Windsor. Um, it's only after the 1830s you see more and more and more networking taking place. But even then, I've written on this, it's very improvisational. Railroad is an unfortunate metaphor in you know because you think of mussolini the trains need to run on time right uh you know the underground that. railroad uh was improvisational in that you might have to change go one route this day go another route another day simply because circumstance stances changed the the people available to help 
somebody along changes. You see slave catchers along one road or trail or another. And, and so things changed. And think of network in a very loose term, even by the beginning of the Civil War, where, yeah, there were people that knew each other um, across many miles and could say, well, yeah, follow this route and or take them in a, hide them in a wagon, take this route, get them to the next place. You never knew too many people ahead though, because if uh, if authorities or slave catchers found out these names, it could you know it could break up a network. So you didn't want the network to be too highly coordinated. Pardon the comparison, but I've heard it described as being like uh, if we you know unlike my students, think back 22 years to 9-11 and think about Al-Qaeda. One of the reasons Al-Qaeda worked is because it was a series of cells very loosely connected, and it was hard for the U.S. and international forces to bring down Al-Qaeda because you could get one cell, but it was very hard to get you know bring the whole group down. And in a positive sense, that's going on with the Underground Railroad, too. The The new thing that we've discovered with the Underground Railroad, including seeing it as less kind of stereotypically routinized and, you know, organized, as, uh, but to see it more improvisational, is to see different kinds of people. You know, we think Quakers, right? The Seabert and everybody else, you know, sees white Quakers helping anonymous freedom seekers. And over time, we found more and more uh, white groups helping. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of anti-slavery Presbyterians in lower Ohio, uh, Southern Ohio, uh, anti-slavery Methodists and others, black communities. There were a lot of black farming settlements throughout the lower Midwest that were involved. Um, and in fact, Cheryl, um, LaRoche, who's an underground road scholar at the University of Maryland, has done some neat research and mapping showing how in Indi Eastern Indiana, for example, African Methodist Episcopal Church networks and their bishop uh, became the conduit for getting, you know, uh, freedom seekers up the eastern o uh, side of Ohio, and they could use their usual denomin uh, denominational connections as a way of not only passing religious information, organizational information, but underground railroad information and helping people along. My addition to uh, the uh, equation in terms of groups is to find that we way underplayed the Native American involvement. Um, early on, from the 1790s, there are, and even before, uh, back as far as the American Revolution, there were freedom seekers that ran away from slavery to particularly the Ohio country uh, uh, and particularly among the Shawnees um, who would take them in, uh, provide them sanctuary. There's this one guy, Caesar, that I write a chapter on who runs away from the Virginia Piedmont, uh, 1774, makes it to the Shawnee villages on the lower Scioto, which is the the river literally runs from Columbus down to uh, the Ohio River straight down. Um, there were a series of Scioto, uh, or a series of Shawnee villages on Scioto. And he was taken in, adopted as a Shawnee, married a Shawnee woman, had uh, uh, children with her and, and ultimately ended up becoming a warrior with the Shawnees and the fight to hold on to the Ohio country. And there are other examples of the Wyandots and the Ottawa in Northwestern Ohio and others, the Miami in Eastern Indiana, uh, taking in um, uh, freedom seekers from slavery and providing them with sanctuary. As time goes on, after the War of 1812, uh, you see more and more Native Americans providing assistance to freedom seekers to help them get to Canada. And uh, oftentimes this is to get to the lake, you know, this uh, 
uh, Josiah Henson, who becomes actually a uh, well-known um, Afro Canadian historical figure, um, is helped by Wyandotte to get to Sandusky, where he gets across the, the lake by the help of a ship's captain. In other cases, to get to Amherstburg or Detroit and across the Detroit River. I've got one chapter where I write about a case in the 1830s where they make it to the Odawa village um, uh, where Grand Rapids is today. And there's 21 freedom seekers uh, that make it there, uh, slave catchers on their tail. And they, the, what, do we, what can we do with these people? There's just been a big race riot in Detroit uh, where they tried to return some uh, 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 freedom seekers, uh, the Blackburns, Thornton and, and Lucy Blackburn, um, uh, tried to get him extradited from Canada. It's not safe to send to Detroit a lot of slave catchers, a lot of hullabaloo, and they decide they will escort these, you know, freedom seekers up the east coast of Lake Michigan to a council site where the Potawatomi, the Odawa, and the Ojibwa, the three fires, typically met for um, um, inter, you know, inter uh, uh, indigenous councils. And there, by prearrangement, they turned them over to the Ojibwa, who took them by war canoe over to the UP, and they walked uh, eastward along the UP and then took canoe over into central Ontario. So I mean, there's a whole range of ways that we find Native Americans uh, uh, assisting the process. And so I think that's, you know, as an example of newly discovered stuff, we always, with the Underground Railroad, have the same thing going on because we find new stuff, and in my case, that was part of it, but also we ask new questions. Well, you know, was this group involved? I think one of the big new things that's starting to unpack with the Underground Railroad is because the uh, the import of women's history and women's studies, a lot more people are looking at the women uh, operatives and not just, a, you know, Harriet Tubman, <laughs> everybody knows, but the women op operatives, black and white, uh, involved in helping freedom seekers. And was, so so was it it was more than just simply hey, as soon as i cross that mason dixon line i'm i'm good to go like they had to like you were saying they had to go above and beyond and actually reach canada in order to feel like quote unquote like safe and they were actually free yeah in in the in the uh, the us constitution when it's written in 1787 there's a fugitive slave clause, which allows uh, slave owners to seek their property anywhere in the U.S. And that's actualized in 1793 by something called the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which sets up a process uh, which allows uh, slave owners or their designates, you know, slave catchers, uh, to chase runaway slaves anywhere in the U.S. And... Um, that same year, ironically, Ontario passes a law called the Abolition Act, what's then called Upper Canada, the Abolition Act, which uh, starts the process of ending slavery in that province and saying that uh, new blacks, you know, blacks that arrive newly in the in in the uh, the province will not be will be assumed to be free. And so you have this double motivation, the push of the Fugitive Slave Act and the pull of Canada now moving towards uh, freedom for black folks. And uh, at first, I would say uh, the, the uh, Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 is haphazardly enforced because it's leaving it up to the individual slave owner and their agents. Um, there's a series in, in 1847, and then some cases in other states, but in 1847 in Michigan, four major slave rescues where groups of 
slave owners and their agents come north to Michigan. There's actually county level planters association that form these groups in northern Kentucky, and they go to uh, uh, you know Cass County, they go to Marshall, they go to um, uh, the the vicinity of uh, Raisin Township, Adrian, in there, uh, and they go to Detroit. And in each case, blacks and whites rescue the groups of slaves they're trying to capture and return. And so in states like Kentucky and others, um, politicians and their allies in the pro-slavery community push Congress to pass a much more rigid and effective Fugitive Slave Act, which is passed in 1850. It's the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And it puts the federal government in the business of helping to catch and return slaves. The U.S. Marshal Service is now tasked with that in terms of catching and holding fugitive slaves. In each county, there are judiciary who are designated or essentially federalized by the federal government to serve as federal fugitive slave commissioners uh, in cases where uh, in that locale, a fugitive slave is captured and return is sought by his alleged owners. And, uh, you know, there's an interesting twist in that. In the law, they designate that if they're determined to be runaway slaves and shall be returned, the uh, federal fugitive slave commissioner is paid $10. And if they determine that they are not a fugitive slave uh, and, and should be allowed to go free, they're paid five dollars. So you know, the abolitionists and blacks immediately say this is kind of bribery. You know, they kind of tilted the the balance scale here. But what it it means is is two things. One, um, slaves caught under the law, runaway slaves caught under the law, a high high percentage of them are returned. But there are some celebrated rescues that occur uh, across the North in those few cases where they aren't able to return them. And that's all the South focuses on. You know, the North is violating our property rights. And in fact, in the uh, secession resolutions that Southern states write in 1860, 1861, as they secede from the Union, that's one of the chief causes they identify is the fact that uh, Northerners are helping freedom seekers escape and they're messing with Southern property rights. So you can make a direct link, I think, between the Underground Road and, and these laws and the, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, Civil War. And it's ironic that it keeps coming up again because just in the last, you know, when was the Dobbs decision? Um, May, I think. May of last year, oh, okay. and yeah. immediately I started to hear references from politicians and on the news because one of the issues was if, let's say, a, a, a woman in Texas wants to go to Michigan and have an abortion, legal in Michigan, uh, what can Texas do to punish her for doing that out of state? And and literally, uh, the, the strategies and the arrangements that some of these anti-abortion states are trying to set up have been defined as akin to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Uh, they're making that that parallel, that comparison, which is kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, I've never heard it. Yeah, I've never heard that comparison before. Wow. Uh, do we know a, a six, like the, the percentage of successful uh routes through the underground railroad railroad and to freedom like is there like a like a quantifiable number on like the number of successful attempts at that um there's an estimate and it's based on educated guesswork um it's most prominently uh, portrayed in um uh a book by uh two notable historians uh uh, John Hope Franklin being one and the other escapes me at this point, a book called Runaway Slaves. It was done a couple decades ago. And they they based this in part on, um, 
you know, reports of runaway slaves by slave owners. They based it to a large extent on the uh, runaway slave advertisements because typically um, slave owners, that was the first way they sought to, the first way they sought to get them back was to get the local slave patrols in Southern districts and turn loose the dogs. After that, then they would post runaway slave ads and send them to newspapers along the route where they most expected their slaves would be going. Um, and there were also reports in the census, you know, the census in 1850 and 1860 asked, you know, uh, slave owners if, you know, slaves had, their slaves had run away and if so how many in the last decade, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so piecing this all together, they come up with an estimate that there are probably 100,000 that successfully get out of the South. Uh, now that's something we have to round off the rough edges a little bit to say, most of those go to Canada or to the North and hide out in the North posing as free, whatever. Um, the, uh, the, there is growing research noting that if you're in Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, places like that, uh, people are running to Mexico because after 1824, Mexico didn't have slavery. And so there's there's actually, we're uncovering more and more African-American descendant communities in Mexico that are being written about. Uh, a few went to the Caribbean. You know, I was just reading um, a report of a guy, John Joseph, who actually celebrated in Australia with a marker uh, just a few weeks ago in Caroline Kennedy as ambassador you know, spoke at the ceremony, but uh, if it's the same John Joseph in his narrative, which he publishes in England, he gets on a boat in the Mississippi River and is able to sail a little bit downstream and about 40 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico, a British vessel picks him up and takes him to England. So you get all these, these, these kinds of ways of getting out of the South. A lot of people get caught, you know, it's hard to totally estimate that. There's a guy, Jay Sel John Sella Martin, who ends up actually as a minister for a time up at Romeo. And uh, Martin, I think if I'm remembering correctly, tries to escape 14 times before he's successful, which means he puts up with a lot of punishment, separation from people he knew, all these kinds of things. But he's persistent. So there's 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 I'm sure tons more people who get caught than that 100,000 who get away. And that 100,000, that's from the revolution of the Civil War, basically. So that's over a long period of time. Um, in addition, you have to count beyond that, there are a lot of other categories. For instance, there are slaves who run away within the South, never try to make it outside the South. Some are what we call Maroons from the French marinage for flight and they go to maroon communities which are communities in the south effectively beyond white control and particularly law enforcement control and uh so they're going to be in places like swamps the frontier way up in the mountains etc and some of these last are you know it's estimated that in uh uh, the Great Dismal Swamp, which is only about, I don't know, something like a quarter, third today of its original size because of drainage and other things. But it was on the eastern Virginia, eastern North Carolina border. Some people think that's where Nat Turner and his folks were headed towards. But the Great Dismal Swamp had a lot of swampland with occasional islands in it, higher ground. And uh, it's known that over the course of decades, before the Civil War, um, uh, blacks would run away from plantations, make it to that maroon community. You know, law enforcement folks with horses and guns couldn't go into the swamp effectively. And they would create communities then on these islands. They even had, they'd take animals and, you know, they'd grow crops. And there are cases we know of from, you know, uh, uh, secret writings that people made at the time uh, that uh, there were, they were involved in black market activity where they're making certain crafts 
and selling them to uh, uh, various businessmen in Norfolk who would sell these crafts in their stores and stuff. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like today where you have to say, you know, product of <laughs> China or whatever it might be, right? Uh, that's one way. The other is that, you know, this is pre-DNA, pre-ID, pre-fingerprint. And, you know, for most of this period, pre-photography. And so a lot of Blacks, and we're increasingly studying this, knowing more about it. A lot of slaves did run away to southern cities, places like Norfolk, Savannah, Charleston. They would settle in the Black community, and they would try to live a normal existence by posing as a free person. And oftentimes this meant that a local Black who was literate would simply write up free papers for them, forged free papers. And, uh, you know, some people probably got away with this the, their whole rest of their life, and other people got caught. There was a guy in um, Baltimore, his name's escaping me, a, a black, a free black, who it is known, he kept, literally he kept uh, a collection of free papers. And what he would do is anytime somebody died in the community, in the black community, he would, you know, ask the widow or widower if he could have their free papers. You know, that person didn't need them anymore. So he literally had, you know, if it was today, he'd have file drawers full of free papers that then he would uh, distribute to freedom seekers as they needed them so that they could live in the community as free people. So it was a you know, very ingenious uh, uh, process, network of people doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So you got to add those to the 100,000 is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. It, are these the routes that were taken for uh the underground railroad are these routes that are memorialized in some way kind of like how like civil war battle there's definite spots of like civil war battlefields are there spots across the country where you can go and visit and see like okay this is where up one of these routes were oh certainly less so than the civil war memorialization there's some groups just starting to look at that. For instance, um, uh, a frequently traveled route uh, through Ohio that's starting to get some recognition is if you if you you know east of Cincinnati, half an hour is Ripley, which is a famous uh, site. Uh, you know, it's where John Rankin and his family would you know post the lantern in their their uh, the upper window of their house high above the hill and runaway slaves could see it from the Kentucky shore and know that was a safe spot. Um, but from Ripley northward, um, you know, Urbana, um, Kenton, Findlay, et cetera, northward, there were a lot of, uh, by the 1840s, let's say, 1850s, there were a lot of um, underground railroad operatives, oftentimes in family or church groupings along that route. And those communities are doing much more to kind of memorialize in a variety of ways. I've seen, uh, you know, locally made documentaries. Um, uh, there are, um, you know, houses that are recognized, churches that are recognized and so forth. Nationally, um, in 1898, the centennial of Siebert's book, uh, Congress passed a law which set up a system called the Network to Freedom through the National Park Service, where communities or individuals can nominate a site, and it takes, you know, it takes research, it takes evidence, but nominate a site to be on the Network to Freedom registry. Um, and, uh, you know, there are hundreds of those sites North and South that are so designated. Ohio uh, has the most by far, but other states like Pennsylvania, New York, and Michigan have a pretty good number as well. And in fact, in Michigan, the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission, which I'm one of the commissioners, if you go to the Mich Michigan Freedom Trail Commission site, you can find uh, 
uh, a map of the sites in Michigan, and you click on the particular spots and it brings up it, other information. It's a it's an interesting feature. Very cool. Now, a, a name that you had mentioned earlier, um, Harriet Tubman, and in in addition to Harriet, were there other like prominent like go to figures that uh, facilitated the Underground Railroad, or is that kind of like the right word to say as far as like Harriet Tubman's role? Well, she's most Underground Railroad operatives um, operate in a specific community, and they might take somebody you know. Uh, 30 miles further along after they, you know, sheltered them and fed them and cared for them. Um, Harriet is a little bit unusual in that she would go deep into slave territory to help guide people out. And she wasn't always nice about it. I mean, uh, people had to be quiet. People had to be orderly. Uh, people had to be under under control as they're moving along these, you know, uh, carrying out s secret and illegal actions. And uh, there are times that Harriet threatened them with, uh, you know, her gun, which she you know, <laughs> carried. Um, uh, there are uh, others, however, that were finding out, you know, there's a guy named John Fairfield who was white, who went frequently, probably one of Harriet's main rivals as somebody who would do this kind of going beyond uh, well, I think of two people I'd want to mention. One is somebody um, who was uh, along the Ohio River, and his name's escaping me. He was at Ripley as well, not John Ranklin, but an African-American there, who uh, it took about 100 years after he told his story in the 1880s to a journalist. It took about 100 years or more before it was published, and uh, it's called His Promised Land. Uh, and this guy, uh, he would go overnightly. He was a barber by day. You talked about your day job. He was a barber by day, but at night he would go across and and guide uh, freedom seekers across the river. And he tended to get away with it. He was very creative. Um, uh, There's a guy, George de Baptiste at Madison, Indiana, just to the west of Cincinnati, that did much the same thing until the price on his head became so great that he he moved up to Detroit and helped with the effort here. But probably somebody that stands out as a rival to Harriet Tubman uh, uh, is a woman named Laura Haviland. And Laura Haviland was in the Adrian Raisin Township area in southeastern Michigan. And she wrote uh, an autobiography uh, after the war of her exploits and uh, uh, it's still in, you know, it's still in print, um, still available in libraries. Uh, but she uh, not only helped people here, which she did, uh, but she is known to have gone south to Kentucky and south to Arkansas and led people out uh, on several occasions and um, having near misses with slave catchers. I mean, her, her autobiography should be made into a, you know, Harriet's was, Laura Haviland's should be made into a movie. Um, and uh, as a, as a, you know, a Michigan person, she, somebody who definitely should be taught in our school curriculum um, uh, because she's going the extra mile really to, and taking a, up a lot of dangers. I mean, there's stories of her in Cincinnati and, and Toledo getting into it with slave catchers and nearly uh, being killed uh by those slave catchers so uh um yeah there's there's a lot of people around uh and uh we're finding more of them all the time part of the problem is the underground railroad unlike the civil war the underground road the underground railroad is an illegal enterprise um most people didn't keep records and those who uh did um you know we know of cases where people burned their records because they began to after the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, they thought, oh my gosh, this is too dangerous. I can't, you know, what if somebody gets a warrant and comes into my house or my foundry? Uh, you know, this is going to be John P. Parker. That was the guy at Ripley, John P. Parker. Okay. He burned 
He burned his records in his foundry after the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act because he thought this is just too dangerous. He was keeping a record of every fugitive he helped. And that was just creating evidence for potentially for a federal trial. <laughs> you know, um, uh, One of the few cases in where we have that kind of detailed records kept and still available is William Still in Philadelphia. And William Still did interviews um, and wrote down the information from every freedom seeker that came before him. And these were hundreds and hundreds. And so he's got lots of information. And uh, and then he visited some of these up in Canada and wrote about them again. I mean, it's a, quite a record, but most people couldn't be that bold. Um, still, as if I recall correctly, actually hid his records in a graveyard, thinking that they'd probably be fairly safe there. I, yeah, I was going to mention it's it's got to be very difficult then to study this topic or write about this topic if these records are so hard to come by. Because, like you said, if people were, you know, afraid of the consequences of keeping these records, that yeah, they would want to get rid of them for you know the sake of their livelihood. Absolutely, and you know. Um, uh... It's frustrating for historians. It's frustrating for local communities who want to get their believed to be underground railroad house or or whatever it might be on the uh, network to freedom registry. And uh, you know, uh, in both cases, you have to have evidence. Um, it's one of the things that has made it a very white history for most of the periods of the Civil War, and that is. Uh, a lot of whites had greater liberty to kind of tell their story after the Civil War, whether it be, you know, uh, people with some national reputation like Laura Haviland or, you know, just local figures who could uh, could write things down and send them to Siebert. Um, you know, African-American operatives after the war, they're still fighting, you know, uh, for the vote and then for other freedoms and so forth and don't always have the luxury of sitting down and writing and then maybe an archive wouldn't consider what they, you know, there was bias in what was de team, uh, determined to be historically important to put in, you know, public archives. Um, so it, it, it does become difficult. Historians have become more creative. I think part of what has happened is looking at alternative kinds of evidence I've, for instance, with Native Americans, I've found uh, that with vetting, you need to take oral testimony more seriously. Um, architectural uh, evidence, um, archaeological, you know, modern archaeological evidence. Uh, for instance, over at Cass County, you know, uh, they knew where some of these groups of freedom seekers were gathering because they could find evidence underground today you know, of where these uh, communities were. Um, just, so just a whole host of things that are being pieced together. I have found that one of my best friends in telling the Native American and freedom seeker story um, has been genealogy because um, uh, believe it or not, there are Native American genealogists uh, that uh, have done a lot of work uh, and that brings in the underground word story and DNA. You know, the tribal group in uh, the United States with the highest evidence of uh, biological intermixture between uh, Native American and African American is the Ojibwe in the Northern Great Lakes. And that could be supplemented by a lot of oral tales and other evidence, uh, including marriage records later on of uh, uh, that embrace of African-Americans that come north, many of whom are freedom seekers by the Ojibwe. So uh, yeah, you gotta, gotta get a little bit creative. Can't just use those books and, and uh, handwritten things out of the archives. <laughs> Something that you had mentioned uh, earlier, a little bit ago, and the, the comparison of 
the Underground Railroad to something like um, the Al Qaeda network. It's it's funny that you mentioned that because I did interview a, a prominent um, researcher in the in the YouTube community. Uh, he has a YouTube channel, and uh, yeah, that I I think that is a good uh, a description that it, it sounds like because I remember talking to him in in my research for that interview uh, when I was reading the September 11th uh, commission report, you have a figure like Osama bin Laden, but you also have a figure, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was uh, one of the planners of September 11th, but also of uh, 1993 when uh, the World Trade Center bombing. And I believe they didn't even meet, I think they only met once in person. And actually a lot of the hijackers uh, on that day, September 11th, I don't even think they uh, like met in person uh, Osama bin Laden, and they even they didn't. It's not like all 19 of them came here at once. They came in like in pairs and groups, and yeah, they they were very isolated, but very much so a group, like a working uh, unit. Um, so I, I yeah, I appreciate that comparison because I've done research into that. Um, I wanted to uh, pivot a little bit uh, f- from the un- Underground Railroad and ask you about abolitionists in this time were were operatives of the Underground Railroad also abolitionists? Did they have like that same role of being anti, like fighting for like legislation that frees slaves in addition to helping slaves escape to freedom? Um, there, you know, think of a Venn diagram. There was an overlap, but it wasn't, by far, it wasn't a complete overlap. There were abolitionists who, uh, depending on circumstances, had nothing to do with the Underground Road, even though they might applaud it or through their churches, they might donate to Underground Road efforts or whatever uh there were underground railroad operatives who you know never went probably to abolition meetings um and it got involved in abolition speaking or you know writing or whatever uh so you know it's two groups that overlap uh somewhat um the uh uh the reality is though they shared a lot of principles and um and empathy for the for the slave, um, and uh, uh, certainly when you see the abolition movement after 1830 begin to bear fruit in terms of members and activists across, particularly across the Midwest, um, you see underground railroad activity pick up. You know because they had those similar principles, even though they weren't always the same same people. And some of them were. I mean, it's amazing uh, when I look at the biographies, you know, biographical sketches on on some of these Midwestern abolitionists, uh, just the volume of kind of reforms that they were, you know, underground railroad work, women's rights, temperance, uh, you know, prison reform. You know, it's like, how did they have time to do their day job, right? <laughs> but but they did and so you yeah you uh you see that um but it wasn't a perfect overlap by a long shot okay. a lot of it occurred like i said families and churches you know what the denomination was and who the minister was could be very influential in if people in that congregation were involved in either one the abolition or the underground railroad uh sometimes freedom seekers were hidden in the basements of churches uh black church in new york in new york in columbus ohio uh headed by a guy named reverend james point dexter they literally created you know how in a lot of older churches you know you've got the ground level short windows and you could see into the basement they deliberately developed the basement and the interior rooms of the basement so there was an optical illusion 
that it looked like you were seeing the whole basement, even though there was a room where the freedom seekers were hid in the basement that wasn't perceived to be there. And so, you know, pe again, people got creative. A lot of it took place in families. John Ranklin in, in, in Ripley is an example. I mean, he had a ton of kids and uh, several of them became ministers like he, but they all were involved in abolition and particularly in the Underground Railroad. And that's where I, th I think the increasing attention to particularly to women's roles um, is going to come because a lot of times, unlike a rank that they weren't writing or telling about their involvement, but, you know, uh, the biggest part of underground railroad work when a freedom seekers in your home is feeding, clothing, providing medical care, uh, providing a place to sleep, you know, uh, all of those things. And who's doing that? It's typically Mrs. Rankin and their daughters. In the case of the Rankins, it's you know, Mrs. Whoever in, in the um, uh, other underground railroad families. And they're all liable for this illegal activity, you know, so they're, they're in, in, in as much danger as the husbands potentially. And we forget about the work they do and the danger they faced. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I know I said, I want, I, I was going to pivot, but one, one other question I just thought of in regards to the un underground railroad um, after, after the passage, you know, years go by and after the passage of the, 13th Amendment ratification of the 13th Amendment, is there still a need for the Underground Railroad or does it eventually, like when does it eventually like fade off or is does it still even continue after after the war, after the passage of the 13th Amendment? Well, the, the, the Underground Railroad disappears during the Civil War. Um, Detroit, for example, uh, they're a very active group here, all black, but worked with whites, called the Colored Vigilant Committee. Uh, they took the last, the last documented freedom seeker they took across to Canada was in April 1862. And it's because they simply didn't see the need after that. Um, the war had the effect, however, of enhancing runaways in the South. Um, starting in spring of 1861 at, at uh, um, Fort Monroe in, in uh, Eastern Virginia, um, you know, the, the Union Army and then Lincoln and the Congress ultimately designated runaways that came to Union lines as contrabands, contrabands of war. So they treat them just like captured artillery, ammunition, livestock, whatever. Uh, and use them as union resources um, and more and more ran away. You know, you, we talked about the 100,000 figure. During the four years of war, 500,000 contrabands ran away successfully to union lines. And um, there was a uh, anonymous contraband interviewed at Camp Nelson in Western Kentucky uh, during the midst of the war, uh, Union encampment. And um, he had run away from like 18 miles away or something like that. And he said, you know, prior to the war, we wanted to get to Canada, but Canada was hundreds of miles away. Now Camp Nelson is 18 miles away. Camp Nelson is our Canada. And so, these folks are running away to union lines. And so there isn't the need to go to the Midwest or wherever. Although if they did go there, they were less likely, there wasn't as active an effort to retrieve them um, during the war. So essentially during the war, the need, the need for the underground railroad in that way dies out. The metaphor lives on. Uh, the metaphor is everywhere. You know, I have seen it for, um, organizations that help uh, Mormon sister wives run away in the West. 
uh, and get out of those sorts of situations. I've seen it for battered women's organizations in places like Saginaw. They call themselves the Underground Railroad for um, for uh, uh, refugees that literally flee through the United States to try to get to Canada. And they refer to that as the, the new Underground Railroad. Um, just a, a whole host of uses of that term in the you know, century and a half sense. So the metaphor is very much alive. The need for an Underground Railroad in that way uh, uh, not after the Civil War, although, you know, people keep using that metaphor and that example, like I said, with the, you know, folks who go out of state for an abortion and return to uh, an anti-abortion state, uh, and now are facing some of the same, potentially some of the same things as in the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And I, I was going to ask this, but it, it sounds like you you kind of just answered uh, this question that I had about the the uh, Fugitive Slave Act um, during the war, or once the war had started, there was no real like enforcement of that either. People weren't going and crossing, you know, the the state lines to go retrieve uh, runaway slaves. Not a lot of enforcement in the North. There were slave states who didn't leave the union like maryland kentucky you know uh missouri west virginia um delaware and for a time initially uh they did enforce it there because these were pro-union slaveholders who they didn't want to they didn't want to tick them off and maybe lose their state to the confederacy so you see, the only place you really see some enforcement um, is uh, is uh, in those border states. And the South, of course, is trying to reclaim those slaves. They don't have the they don't have the federal apparatus, the Union anymore, to do that. Usually, it becomes a more localized effort. But with the soldier boys off to war and fewer white men around on the farms and plantations and cities, it means that. People can run away more easily, which is why you get that 500,000 number, uh, five times what you got in the century from the revolution of the Civil War. Okay. Okay. Um, it's funny. I, I know I said I wanted to pivot away from Underground Railroad, but just more questions keep coming up. <laughs> at, at the time, as far as what's going on politically, uh, in Washington, are do are people you know representatives, senators, Abraham Lincoln, or I I mean I guess Lincoln isn't president until 1860, but are people are the politicians aware of what is going on with the Underground Railroad? Is it reaching them? Uh yeah. But, I mean, one, it's one of the reasons ultimately to push for the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Um, uh, to, uh, you know, some of those senators and representatives are losing slaves themselves because they're slave owners, including some Supreme Court justices. Five of the nine were Southern slave owners, you know, in the late 1850s. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, uh, it was pretty well known Southern slaveholders and their allies articulated a good bit, including on the floor of Congress. And um, there were abolitionists who were very, not open about the details, but open about the existence of Underground Railroad. Frederick Douglass was one, and it ticked some of his abolitionist peers off because they thought we shouldn't be agitating, you know, Southerners in this way, Southern whites, by talking about the Underground Railroad. It's kind of in your it's in your face too much. Let's uh, let's back off a little bit. Um, the let's make it the alleged underground <laughs> railroad or whatever, right? Uh, but yeah, it was, it was well known. Okay, so it, like in that sense, they didn't want to bring too much attention to it for fear of like exposing it like t a little too much and bringing you know that too much attention to it. 
yeah. some abolitionists in, you know, the uh, um, the fear was that would, you know, people like Douglas talk about it too much. And even though they're talking about it vaguely, it would uh, it would enhance the likelihood that, you know, that Southern uh, slaveholders and their political allies would would uh, try to crack down even more. OK, I see. Yeah. I mean, that would kind of. If I was living at that time, yeah, I would not. I would say, hey, why are we trying to ruin a good thing uh, that's happening right now? Um, yeah, I, I, I totally understand that perspective. Um, after, well, l- let me ask you this, Roy, because uh, we've been going on, it's actually an hour and a half right now. Um how are you on time? And, you know, totally, we can end it right here, too, if if need be. Well, we can do another question, and then maybe we can segue out of here. How's that? Absolutely. And, and you know, I tell you what, I'll, um, we could end it on this. I, You know, I wanted to ask you, uh, currently, you know, with your work, are you currently working on something right now, like uh, a book or anything like that, that or um, research, uh, anything like that that you're working on? Well, uh, I'm kind of the the ADD historian in that I always find these interesting things that I want to follow up. And so I've got bits of research done in a whole lot of things. And I suppose maybe that's the way a lot of historians who have passion for this stuff do but i'm working on a book and have been for several years on it's called the indigenous underground Railroad. that's kind of the working title and it's looking at as i said earlier the um the ways native americans indigenous peoples in the midwest assisted freedom seekers starting with the sanctuary uh, providing sanctuary in their village like i i said uh uh, the Caesar, and there were many, many other examples uh, later on helping people get northward to Canada. Um, sanctuary never goes away. This, I mean, my last chapter is a guy named William Swan, who is uh, befriended in northern Michigan by the Odawa and Ojibwe, and, and uh, they help him and his family through many crises in the early 1860s uh, when he is a fugitive slave. Um, and, uh, uh, other examples, uh, you know, I mentioned the one where the Odawa and Ojibwe take, you know, these 21 freedom seekers through Northern Michigan, but there's another example of, uh, a, uh, freedom seeking family that goes through Eastern Wisconsin and is helped by the Stockbridge and Brothertown Indians up to Green Bay and then, uh, put on a boat, uh, friendly sea captain who takes them uh uh you know th- across northern lake michigan into lake huron and leaves them off at uh, sarnia so um in in ontario so you know there's a um that's what i'm doing and, and it's a series of case studies that ranges from the revolution to the civil war involves a lot of native americans getting sanctuary in indian villages but also these being helped to Canada, and the idea is to begin to present a picture of Indigenous or Native American involvement through a series of case studies, which is where the evidence kind of took me because it's harder to get the full picture uh, because of what's available. Wow, I I am excited for that book to come out. I would definitely be a customer. Uh, So yeah, I'm excited for that. I'll email you when the time comes. I, I, I did want to say that mm-hmm. one of the things that, you know, I talked about sometimes historians uh, make breakthroughs because of serendipity. And in an odd sort of way, COVID was my serendipity because libraries and archives were off limits for a time. And so using various informants, I set up hundreds of uh, virtual interviews with Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwa elders, sometimes in a group, sometimes individually, who pass down kind of the descendant stories of their involvement. Sometimes it's been passed down through families. 
sometimes through communities like the uh, 1830s example that I told you of helping these 21 freedom seekers, uh, just a whole mix of things. Uh, and uh, so that that got me in a whole new track, which opened up particularly the upper Great Lakes area for me. And uh, I've been using slave narratives and, you know, local histories and, you know, all those kinds of things to sell some of the lower Midwest story. But that opened up the, the kind of the upper Midwest story for me. And it's it's funny because this uh, YouTube channel and this podcast started in 2020. So, I, yeah, uh, COVID, um, it helped kind of the time alone <laughs> in my home kind of inspired me to do this this channel and this podcast. Um Roy, thank you very much uh, for having this conversation with me. I this is such a fascinating topic, and I know we we've gone a long time, and I didn't. I have so many other questions that I could ask you, but I, I would love to have you back on again to go into some other things. We can do that another time, and uh, send me the uh, uh, the link when you've done all the editing and everything. Okay. Hundred percent. And uh, and Roy, is there any? Are, are you on social media at all? Like, if people want to connect with you or see, like, you know, any previous work you have? Um, I, no, I'm uh, I'm not, and and uh, for a variety of reasons. One being the fact that I'm 69, <laughs> but uh, you know, you you have my email, and you can contact me, and I don't, you know, I don't mind you posting the email if if uh, listeners have you know, questions they want to follow up on. Um, the, awesome. uh, uh, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a Twitter buff or <laughs> it's not a bad certain piece, certain people in the public eye have, have cured me from even exploring Twitter and, and uh, some of those things. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, I totally get, I, I am only on social media because I, I have to be kind of, right. um, but Roy, thanks again. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody out there for listening. My name is Chris. This has been Cheetash. Take care, everybody.